Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Air Force Association's headquarters in Northern Virginia, where we're conducting our last interview of AFA's Airspace and Cyber Conference and Trade Show. Uh, that happened a couple of days ago over at the Gaylord National Harbor, uh, right outside Washington, D.C. Our coverage at AFA was sponsored by uh, L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS. And uh, my, my friend Steve Sargent, a uh, retired United States Air Force Major General, who is the CEO of Marvin Test Solutions, uh, I told you we would interview you, and by God, before you were heading back to California, Steve, we were going to interview you. So I'm glad you made time uh, out, of, out of your day for us. Um, you were, uh, before you retired, you were the uh, commander of the Operational Test and Evaluation Center out at Kirtland Air Force Base. You're now with uh, Marvin Test Solutions. We've had very interesting conversations over the years. Tell us a little bit about what you guys do, because you are a very interesting company that brings together at a, at a group level engineering capabilities at, at your part a whole series of testing systems that could actually kind of help the Air Force save an enormous amount of money by just changing the way that it does things. Talk to us a little bit about the group and what you guys do. Well the Marvin Group is located out in Southern California. Our flagship is Marvin Engineering Company that was started back in 1963 and it's become the largest producer of alternate mission equipment. That would be bomb racks, launchers, and pylons in the Western Hemisphere. Marvin Test Solutions was asked to join in 97. We've been supporting them since the company was formed in 88. And we provide the production level test equipment for Legacy as well as fifth generation aircraft, specifically F-35 in Marvin Engineering, as well as we provide test equipment for Legacy aircraft around the world. We're in 26 countries today with our military test equipment, as well as supporting aerospace and manufacturing companies. Two other companies in the group, Flyer Defense makes a vehicle called Flyer, replacing the Humvee in Special Operations Command and in the Army, perhaps other services soon as well, and, and the Marvin Land Systems Company, which does environmental control systems, overpressurization systems, and power generators. And, and talk to us a little bit about what you guys were featuring uh, at AFA uh, this year. You know, everybody always has the, the, the sort of flagship products they're putting out in front of the customer. You were very busy the whole time. Uh, so pretty much every, every time that we tried to, to, to talk to Steve, there was pretty much somebody far more important than us that were talking to you. Talk to us a little bit about some of the things you guys were highlighting at the show. Well, Vago, thanks for taking the time today. The, it was a very busy show for us. I don't think we had more than 30 minutes free the entire time. Both Marvin Engineering Company and Marvin Test Solutions were located uh, in our booth this year. Marvin Engineering Company had what we call the smart triple ejector rack, where we add 1760 bus capability to an, to an existing piece of armament the Air Force has for A-10s and F-16s. And now we can make that not only capable of legacy weapons, but carrying smart weapons and multiples more than two for those airplanes for just a modification cost. Marvin Test Solutions had equipment providing with Marvin Engineering Company life cycle management at the point of use capability for legacy as well as fifth generation aircraft. Um, let me ask you about, um, well, for example, if you want to test a missile on an airplane, um, I think that fo most folks who are not in the Air Force universe don't know what an, an elaborate and, and sophisticated process you've got to go through. Puts a lot of wear and tear on the weapon, puts some wear and tear on the airplane as well. Whereas if you had a different type of test equipment that some of which could be relatively inexpensive for each ship set, or very inexpensive for each ship, ship set, allows you to be able to do that. Talk to us a little bit, you know, you, use that as an example about how rethinking processes of procedures, you were an aviator, you know, you know, you know what, what the whole drill was like. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, how changing how the customer could think about things could actually free up quite a lot of resources that are now being expended in sort of what people might consider in an invisible way, but that carries cost with it. Correct. So today, legacy aircraft and others are using technology that was developed over 30 years ago. Stray voltage and continuity test was on, the only test available when the airplanes that are flying today were fielded. However, in the, past, in the past few years, there's new technology that will allow you to actually emulate a weapon with a small piece of test equipment, less than four pounds, to go out and test the launcher and the interface of the airplane fully to ensure the 1760 bus, which is critical to smart weapons operations, is going to work, and that it just doesn't have a good wire going into it and a good wire coming out. In other words, a continuity test. That's available today in many countries are flying with it. Every TA and FA-50, for instance, gets issued that as part of their kit. Others that have F-16s at their bases are immediately starting to use it because of the similarities. We've got that in 10 countries today, uh, and the numbers are starting to grow. That reduces the risk of loading weapons, tons of weapons, on an airplane, 
taxiing, getting airborne, and then the pilot finding out the weapon doesn't work because there was a flaw on the 1760 bus. And, and basically, that's also wear and tear on the weapon, battery life on the weapon, depot time. I mean, it all adds up, doesn't it? Well, it does. Today, once every 60 or 90 days, you do a preload check, and you just check continuity and straight voltage. If you could do the 1760 full check, you will reduce the risk of mission failure in the future, and you will reduce, reduce the amount of maintenance that has to be done once missiles and or uh, bombs are loaded on the aircraft, and then the problem is found. And uh, let me take you to the whole sort of, um, there's greater focus now than there's ever been on sort of cradle to grave support, you know, figuring out how small engineering decisions early in a program could actually help you save enormous amounts of cost. Uh, our allies look at military acquisitions from that standpoint. Historically, we have not. We've always placed the premium on extreme performance, even if it did carry a, a rather large cost with it. What are different sorts of testing techniques, different sorts of approaches throughout the life cycle of a system could, could, could help you actually save money at the end? Well, the more that you can provide the supply chain of spare parts uh, and the knowledge of how to repair the armament, for instance, at the point of use, you cut down on the time, you cut down on the cost of transportation, moving armament away from where it's being used. So for, a, for an investment in training early on in the maintainer's life to get to that point of eye level, what we might say intermediate level plus, to be able to go beyond just, well, here's a bad part, pull it, put it in a pile, get to the part of, get to the point where you could actually do more repair. Now you can put that piece of armament back on the airplane and continue to prosecute the mission. Uh, you guys are a, a, a company that's in an interesting place in the ecosystem. You know, you're, you're not tiny, but you're not giant. What are some of the, challenge that, the challenges that you guys have competing against companies that are much larger than you guys are in some cases? Um, and how do these funding uncertainties, like continuing resolutions, how does that affect your lives? You know, we have a tendency of hearing it from very, very big guys. We have a tendency of hearing it from very little guys. You guys are sort of in that middle range where there are so many contractors at that size that are actually, you know, the whole industry depends on. Talk to us a little bit about how you stay competitive with folks and then what this funding uncertainty means for somebody like you, the CEO of, that, of a business like that. Well, we certainly don't uh, wake up every morning trying to compete with the large primes. We actually try to become even bigger and better suppliers to them, providing capabilities that they may not have time nor really the desire to work in their own organization. And we do that, and our job is to show them and bring to them what the operators and the maintainers are requesting. So that's what we do to work together to actually grow the market space that we occupy. And uh, what about the impact of continuing resolutions? Is there any impact on that as far as you can tell, um, you know, in, in trying to run the business? Well, there is when all of the services have to prioritize what they're going to buy. These continuing resolutions do not really start, allow the innovation that many of them would like to start. You mentioned earlier changing. Well, you have to change in some ways the mentality of those who've been using 30 or 40 year old technology for many, many years to get to the point to realize they could actually have better mission readiness at very low increase in the amount of work they're doing because they're already checking. Now for a couple extra minutes, they can check further. So when you have a continuing re resolution and innovation is stifled, those type of priorities are gonna stay below the cut line because test and training, for instance, we all know in the acquisition process when there's stress, those are the last things to be funded, the first thing to be defunded, and we'll get to it later. So that does make it challenging, but we work very hard to bring the right kind of, the right level of capabilities that they really would like to have to be up above that line where we can be. Um, do, when you look at, um, th there's a lot of talk about innovation, uh, and you just mentioned it a minute ago, we were talking about it earlier in the conversation. Are, are, are folks as open to innovation and changing how they operate as they want to believe that they are? Well, I, I think that most people recognize technology uh, when they see it uh, in the, providing the ability to have better mission readiness at lower cost and to reduce the workload on their maintainers or on their pilots. But they have to be prioritized within a budget and we're uh, within the budget and we're still in a budget constrained environment. It's not sequestration is totally gone. The caps are not all removed and continuing re resolutions are still a part of a fact of life until that changes. Those priorities 
even when they change, there's still going to be prioritization, but I think there will be more below the cut line until it changes. Last question on F-35. Um, F-35, like a lot of newer aircraft, has a lot of self-diagnosis, self-test capabilities. Uh, that's kind of your side of the <laughs> ballpark. How does that change how you approach it, and how do you guys find opportunity in a program like that? Well, the airplane is absolutely wonderful in all the amount of self-test it has. Most of that is around avionics, check some of the communication buses and that sort of thing. But when it comes to armament, you only really know the armament's going to work when you've got a weapon on there to actually do a functional check. And that's what we provide in a piece of a test quit equipment. So we don't wear out the weapons. And more importantly, we don't end up with a weapon being loaded with all that extra work of maintainers and the pilot getting launched or ready to launch and then finding out either during taxi or airborne that the system's not working properly. Steve, thanks very much for joining us and have a great trip back to California. Paco, thanks very much. It was great to be here. It was a great AFA and we're happy to participate in it. Yeah, absolutely tremendous show. It's a highlight every year. Thanks very much, sir. Thank you.